because every practice is different, small or large. Every DSO is different. And I think there's great aspects to all, but defining it and making sure it's written down and trained to, I think is a really important piece. And if you look at other industries that have the great culture, those are the same principles they bring. Hey there, dental economist. If you're a dentist owner or a leader within a dental business thinking about growing production, case acceptance, patient and staff satisfaction, positive outcomes, and everything else that comes with running a dental business, then you're a dental economist and you've come to the right place. Welcome to the Dental Economist Show. We're meeting at the intersection of profit and purpose as I sit down with dental leaders who share their stories about dentistry, business, and growth. Welcome back to the Dental Economist Show with me, Mike Huffaker. Today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Sam Zarabi, co-founder of Rodeo Dental, joining us. Dr. Sam has been a visionary leader in the dental industry, guiding Rodeo Dental through the successful launch of over 40 large group practice locations. His commitment to fostering a positive team culture and improving patient care has earned Rodeo Dental numerous accolades, including being named Top Dentists by Fort Worth Magazine and Best Dentists by D Magazine for the past five consecutive years. Dr. Sam's dedication extends beyond the practice with significant contributions to professional organizations and charitable initiatives. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Thank you, Mike. Honored to be here and um, appreciate what you're doing for dentistry and the DSO space. I think it's awesome. Well, thank you very much. First off, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity uh, that you afforded me yesterday to sit in on your town hall meeting. I found it very enjoyable. It was very inspiring to get a glimpse into some of the secret sauce that makes Rodeo Dental what it is. I will say, since we just met, I won't refer to you by the nickname that Dr. Dorfman so affectionately calls you. My mom calls me Sami, like from when I was a really little. Now all my team, a thousand of my team members got to see me get blasted by the nickname my mom gave me. <laughs> they enjoyed it though. I could tell from watching the video as he was saying it, everyone, you know, the giggles were, were definitely there. It was good. Well, let me ask you, kind of walk me through a little bit of, of your background and how you found dental in the first place. And then what led you to founding Rodeo? Born in, in London, moved right away to LA post 79 in the revolution in Iran. My parents got separated at a young age of four and um, grew up, you know, with essentially my, my single mom in LA for a bit. And um, she got remarried, met my stepdad, Dr. Rod in Los Angeles, who'd been practicing for almost 40 years there. I got to grow up watching him at a very young age in the dental practice. He's somebody that's always emulated a great patient experience, just ultimately just really treating his patients that have been seeing him for 40 years, right? And they're just loyal to him as the guy. And I'd watch uh, episodes of I Love Lucy in the break room while I'd be waiting for him or, you know, seeing him do sterile. And kind of got my first experience at that in life and ended up going to UCLA in college. And at that point, I started to explore what a lot of us do at that time. Am I going to do med school? I'm going to do any, you know, business. I'm going to do anything and everything except dentistry. But I liked healthcare and taking care of people. And so neandered and struggled my way through college till I actually met Dr. Bill Dorfman. And at that point, it was at the height of extreme makeover coming online and zoom whitening and cosmetic dentistry. And and I was able to see another side of dentistry that was super inspiring. Like I love the taking care of the people piece, but also what is possible in our field. And so got a chance to gain mentorship from him, work in his practice, really see dentistry in a high speed growth environment, which was really cool. And from that point, got into a dental school at Pacific. And interestingly, in that class that I had, was two of my future partners in dentistry, Dr. Brian Dagoni, Mansoor, and then also my future wife. It was in that class as well. And so we had this really cool group of friendship and came out in 2008 during the financial crisis. You remember that summer of 08? It was crazy. All this sort of chaos with banks. And instantly you went from like all these potential jobs to like, hey, things are drying up quick and instability. You had to... Two weeks before dental school, 
graduation, I was forced to go with Maggie to Lausanne, Switzerland, where Dr. Dorfman did his residency in cosmetic dentistry. And I had to make call an audible because the Euro shot up, loans weren't going to get recognized. Like I'd be living in a park bench essentially in Europe. And I was like, okay, this is not an option. And so my buddy from college called me and said, hey, come out to Texas. There's some jobs. There's access to care needs. Cost of living is low. You know, let's look at this as an option. And so I would have never pictured being in Texas and fast forward, got my first job in Fort Worth in an underserved area. And it really was not what I expected. Let's just say it was, it was a complete opposite of an experience. Place was run down the way the patients were treated and stabbed. It was just not the typical experience of what I grew up around. Left that. So I was jobless in Texas 40 days later and uh, trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I thought if, if this is what was being delivered here in the community, I know we can do better. And partnered with my buddy. Uh, so he was doing a practice, didn't know what we were quite doing, but went for it. That fall, we opened our first location. Learned a lot that first year. It was sort of your traditional practice, partner with Henry Shine, partner with all the local contractors, but we were super focused on service and experience. Fast forward a year, I absolutely loved the stockyards in Fort Worth where the famous rodeo is. It just reminded me of like Disneyland and Frontierland and and growing up around that. And I love that focus on experience and family. And so our location, that second location a year later was right by the stockyards and the rodeo. And I was like, well, why don't we just call it Rodeo Dental? It fits. We can make it fun. We'll go big on the lobby. We'll create some experience. And then build in that culture of success that I learned from Dr. Dorfman and Steve Anderson and a lot of these guys that I grew up watching as the great ones in the in the 90s and early 2000s. And so let's implement that same sort of thinking in our practice. And it exploded. We brought in specialty. And so we started to grow from there. We went from two to six. We went to South Texas. We started to bring on other specialty partners. And from there, we organically grew. In 2019, we partnered with the Bain Capital Double Impact Group. And that was a big step for us. We were at 21 locations at that time. And we really wanted to grow the business and take it to other states. And so bringing on a partner like that, we thought that can really help us with the right alignment and thinking of mission-driven like we are. So today, as we stand, we've got 47 locations. We're across the three states, Arizona, Colorado, and Texas. We've got about 200 providers across all the specialties, a thousand amazing team members that you saw yesterday. And this past year, we won the Fortune Impact 20 award. We made the list, which was the first time in dentistry. It was pretty cool. That's a great story. So I have so many questions from that. You talked about opening the first practice, calling it Rodeo Dental and opening it right next to the stockyards. You went all out with kind of design experience, From that moment forward, was it kind of crystallized in your brain that as you move forward, if you were going to open more practices, that you would keep this theme throughout? Like, did you recognize, I I know you did it initially because it was by the stockyards, but did you recognize that there was a place in the world of dentistry for having kind of this consistent experience, consistent theme, and like a branded experience, not just the branded by the doctor's name on the door, but by the actual organization that that somebody would go and seek service from? I think I did locally, not at the scale that we are today. I didn't foresee that. I knew that locally there was that experience needed, and we went into the DFW area and then South Texas. And so we went from two to six locations pretty quick. And that transition from going to that, you kind of go, okay, what's next for me as I'm working in the chair full time, six days a week, I'm managing, you know, you start to bring in your friends that are colleagues and dentists and they work with you alongside you. And so you create this really cool culture of a team of about a hundred and it works. And so then you start to propel and get bigger. And when we started to go from about six to 10 locations, that was that next layer stage that I was like, okay, now we're going into like another region like Houston and there's a need there. And you start to realize like, we do have something here that's got consistency in the system, consistency in the aesthetics and product and experience. And that was when I kind of figured, okay, I'm going to have to step out of the chair 
and start to put more of my managerial hat on and working with the teams and building the vision. But it was around that frame from like six to 10 that I think I, I noticed that. Now, Rodeo is, is known for having a unique and special culture. And when you think back at kind of the inception of Rodeo, when did it become clear that culture was just going to be so important? Was that a day one thing for you? Was it something that evolved over time? And I guess kind of the follow-up to that is, and maybe you can answer it first, is like, what is your definition of a good culture? What it means to you? Good question. So I'll, I'll answer the first part first. Yes, from day one within the practice, for sure. Just watching like Dr. Dorfman's practice and my dad's and, and going to a lot of the like Crown Council events, that was emphasized, right? Having a great morning meeting with the team, you know, these five to 10 to 20 principles that we're reviewing every month and day with the team. So those basics within the practice, yes, absolutely. And then I loved and studied brands throughout my 20s around like like Zappos, Delivering Happiness. That was a huge uh, book and inspiration for me because I loved that you can create that energy and take that at scale. That sounded really fun and intriguing for me. So we did really work from the beginning to make sure that we had the basics in place and to make sure every new location, we were talking to those things that are not necessarily the clinical or technical pieces. So I would say from that standpoint, for sure. And then how would you describe what culture means to you or what it means to, to your teams? I spoke about this recently at Dykema, actually, and uh, where we spoke, and there was three really big aspects to it. The first one I talked about was indoctrination. That's really like setting the standards. What is the values? What is what we look like? You know, the things hanging on the wall beside me, those are in every location. So building into that foundation of your identity and what the culture is going to look and feel like, because every practice is different, small or large. Every DSO is different. And I think there's great aspects to all, but defining it and making sure it's written and down and trained to, I think is a really important piece. And if you look at other industries that have the great culture, th those are the same principles they bring. The second piece is the repetition in the training and really making sure that from office one to five to 10, and even today as we scale, it's not easy. Uh, as geographies widen and you're not physically present, now we have to have other leaders at every level making sure they're repeating and making sure they're training to those same concepts. And then the last piece is celebrating. You saw that yesterday as an example. You know, we got our belts right here as an example. There is a fun that you can bring into it to celebrate. And it doesn't necessarily like, I think a lot of times if you look historically in dentistry in the 80s and 90s, everything was built around bonus this, bonus that. But I think you can go, there's an intangible beyond. Like there is no monetary value attached to this. But I will tell you, people will run through a wall to get this belt and win, as you saw yesterday. So I think there's ways to celebrate that go beyond just getting that extra buck, which is great. I think that that's nice, but you want to build something around that energy that reflects the core values and principles. Yeah, it's a great example of human motivations and how they vary depending on individuals and that it is not always all about monetary reward. And there's a lot that can tie in to really bring in a lot more satisfaction with somebody's role, with wherever they are, separate and apart from just the financial elements and recognition, obviously, is a huge piece. Tying fun things in like you guys have with the belt and all the noise with the cowbells and everything it adds that extra energy, which is which is amazing. So, when was the first office that you opened? The one by the stockyards. What year was that? Fall of '08, and, and then the first rodeo was fall of '09. Okay, so that was a terrifying time for a lot of people. I was just a few years out of college myself as 2008 hit. And I remember having a lot of friends out of work. I was in a commission only job and I actually became $50,000 in the hole in my commission only job based off my draw, where I wasn't going to earn any money for like a year is very scary. And it was a lot of uncertainty. So you kind of took this bold move of founding a new business at that time after working somewhere that was completely counter expectation to everything that you had grown up with and all the examples that you had seen with your stepfather and Dr. Dorfman. And, and I imagine that kind of turned a light bulb on to you to the potential that there was in, in that area. Most founder stories 
have some moment where it's like this kind of like, oh crap moment, or like, is this actually going to work? Or are we going to have to shut the lights out? Or are we going to not make payroll? Did you have any of that? Or was it generally like once you started going, did you feel like from the outset, like things were hard, but it was never terrifying? No, for sure. Terrifying. And because you, you compound that with student debt too, right? We certainly had that. And so I think in a lot of ways, born from the fire in these moments in time and history, back then the traditional solo practice was very much way bigger than the DSO growth was. I mean, DSOs were there, but it was still like that first DSO 1.0, I think they call it, of the big five. And so people were still gravitating towards, and the financial system was still gravitating towards supporting dentists that were opening up their own locations with the banks. So that became really tough even then, right? So they wouldn't even lend to someone like me out of school, tons of debt, and now you want to take on another half million dollars. It wasn't working. So what we had to do was, that's why we had to kind of partner and create the group practice. So I partnered with my orthodontist partner. I partnered with my general dentist buddy, our pediatric dentist partner. And so we partnered together. And so now we brought three to four dentists to the table with the bank. Now getting a half million dollars, we're like, okay, we can sign off on this. And so through that, we wanted the group practice model, but the system also sort of, in a way, pushed us towards it. So I think every great story requires something that's like that thing you can't predict in the environment that brings you together. And so economically, it made sense. And then also in the practice model, it made sense for us to do it that way. And that's what helped us get bank loan after bank loan. And that's what we did. We went literally, each practice was a new individual bank loan and we had to go get those within our, our partnerships. Yeah. And taking on that level of debt over a relatively short period of time, was that nerve wracking? Did you always have the confidence that like, look, we're going to make this through. It is okay. Kind of walk me through what those emotions were like. It might be good to ask my partners because they would say I have a fairly good way of blocking some of that emotion out of the stress. And maybe that's helped me catapult is to be able to compartmentalize that kind of stress level. Because to me, I was so convicted with, I knew that if we delivered a great product that it would work. And so I was willing to take that risk at that point with each location. At the same time, I think when you think about it and what was going on at that time, it was pretty stressful. A lot of those loans, I still had my parents attached to co-signing the original student debt. And so I had to make sure, you know, we got all that in line. So it was scary from that perspective. At the same time, I think it, we used it as a way to put some good fear behind us to inspire us to make it succeed. So we were flying city to city and people were covering each other in terms of which practices they were covering. You know, I moved to South Texas, which was a big move for me and the wife, but it was um, awesome. Like I look back on it and it ended up being so much fun and what a great time in our life to be in a place in the world I would have never predicted 10, 20 years ago. And so it worked out for us. But yeah, there was definitely some stress in there for sure. <laughs> I would imagine. So now fast forward to, uh, you said it was 2019 when you partnered with Bain and you received some additional financial sponsorship. At that moment, you guys were, I think you said roughly 20 practices. And then in the five years that have elapsed since then, you've grown to 47. So really kind of accelerated. Those types of transactions, they... They come with a lot of joy and they're obviously at that point, there's a lot of financial benefit that's received, but the pressures kind of maybe change in a, in a sense and share a little bit about from your perspective, like there's these pressures when you're first founding, you go through a partnership like that with somebody like Bain, and then now you have this new charter to grow maybe in a faster way or accelerate your growth. There's pros and then there's different kind of things that come along with that type of experience. Can you share a little bit about from your perspective, what changes after that? I think two things. The first is when you bring on a partner and I think at any size, right? Like obviously Bain is incredible as known as being one of the best partners in the world because the smartest people in the world and they have the most resource and they bring a really sophisticated way of helping the business really professionalize in every aspect, right? From your financial systems and accounting to the way you report and you're professionalizing the business for scale. And I think that's where a lot of the misconception or, or understanding of what you're trying to do at the end of the day, if you're bringing on 
a personal friend as a partner that's like, hey, I want to invest with you. What are we all doing? We're doing it to grow, right? And scale. And so when you bring on someone at that level, you're signing up to grow and scale because you believe that you have something that can be taken across states, across the country, maybe around the world, right? Depending on how good your product is. And to me, I think when we're at our best and we're delivering, we absolutely have something that can and should be everywhere. I, I would love to take the brand around the world. Obviously, we have to figure out the regulatory and insurance types, but I believe at its core in its experience and what it can deliver, that would be something that the world can benefit from. So having somebody that can help you do that, both in growth. So there's two things to it. One, having to go to the bank every time and redo underwriting for every one location that you're doing at a certain size and scale. And a lot of times I think you see it around 20 locations becomes fairly complex and difficult to do. And it, it ends up obviously starting to slow you down if you start to grow. So that was one thing that they solved. Bringing the resources and professionalizing the business. There's no doubt we're better today than where we were five years ago from just the way we've been able to create better benefits for our employees, the structure, everything is just really built to scale. And then the last piece that I think is not talked about enough in our field is the speed of which you have to scale. I think when you're doing these things, you are signing up to really grow and accelerate and you have to be ready. And that is not necessarily a thing that should be a negative to the partner. It's really, if you're taking this on, you need to be able to go at that speed because it's like you're going from like high school to NFL pro. And so it's just a different speed and it takes a minute to get used to it. But once you do, then you're, you're sort of getting to that next level of what's possible in growth. Now you're going to multiple states. Now you have something that can grow across the country, hopefully. Is there a mind shift that needs to take place? And what I mean is, you know, for the, the first years prior to the partnership with Bain, you are essentially making these decisions with your partners and with the folks that you work with about how you want to grow and what you want to do. And then you bring in financial sponsorship and that changes the dynamic to some extent. And even with somebody that is as professional and as excellent and as smart as a Bain, there may be feelings of losing some autonomy or having to kind of do things in a different way that can make people uncomfortable. Is it something where you just kind of have to lean into, look, this was a, a choice that we've decided to make and we really feel excited about the potential of where this can go. And it's all right to lean into our uncomfortableness as a result of that because it's going to get us to where we want to be long term. Well, one, I want to give them credit because they give us incredible autonomy. And what I mean by that is it's a trust in the partnership and in the decision making of us as the founders and, and me as the CEO to go, okay, you guys know how to run this thing. You go make those. Those are on you. At the same time, I would recommend anyone who's thinking about going this route, you need to understand how to operate in a board setting because that's really what you're doing. You're expanding yourself as the you know, maybe if you're a partnership of, of three to five, or maybe as you're the lone person growing it, you're bringing on some really smart people to serve on a team as a board. And to me, I think that's an important piece that if you're thinking about going and you, if you've never served on a board or been as a part of a fairly good size one, that's a great learning process to see because what a board does is one, it creates shared accountability, which is great. I think it allows some decision-making processes to have some really good checks and balances, which are important. And so I think from that standpoint, getting used to that as like maybe in terms of speed of decisions or how we're thinking about things, or you may as a founder be like, hey, my gut and feel is like, I know this is right, so I just need to just do it versus, hey, let's really talk through it. What's the thinking there? Maybe is it good to prove it out first? Because that's the other thing, like founders too can be fairly fast moving, right? So it sometimes it does take a minute to go, hey, did you check the review mirror on this and this? So I think at scale, those are important pieces when you're, when you're trying to go to a larger geographical region. Yeah, when you grow as fast as you have over the past five years, and when you have such a focus on culture and supporting the teams, and it's really from the outside, I would say it's a passion of yours and, and, and like something that you really believe in. What are the biggest dangers or pitfalls or obstacles to watch out for that would prevent you from keeping the culture as you want it to be? Oh my gosh, look at the last five years, right? Who could have predicted any of it? 
You can't almost. I so I think where where you really have to have the strongest points is in the foundation, right? Like who could have predicted COVID? COVID was a a shredder of culture for us too. We're we're very much high engagement. We like to see each other. We being present in the offices. There's a touch and feel to it that people can emulate in the energy of the brand, and that got immediately shut down. And so you know, like the town hall you saw yesterday, that was a response during that time that we had created and that emulated into what it is today. But at the time, it was just a forum for us to talk about the different settings of what PPE is going to look like in the check-in process and the temperature check and blah, blah, blah. Today, it's become this whole other thing. So I think being agile and your ability to be able to be flexible in your responses while keeping the foundational core of the principles you have in place and so what our culture looks like today is very different than five years ago or 10, but we're embracing that change. Like, that's okay. It is going to change. It is going to feel different, but you have to have the core principles and then being able to change because whether it's COVID, inflation, regulatory changes that come down, things are going to happen. Like they're big or small. You just got to be ready and have that core foundation really tight. When you talk about the core foundation or core principles, what are those for radio? What do you share with the team? You have like a unified set of principles. You've got nine and have those remained consistent over time? Have you updated them? Do you reevaluate whether or not they are still speaking to the organization in its current state? Like, how do you think about that? So they have changed over time from if you would have looked at our first card and core values from 15 years ago were very different. And then really in 2016, we had a deep dive. We felt like we had a lot of the basics that I started with from day one, but it was time for like a refresh. And so the nine we have today, we actually updated to eight in 2016. We added the ninth in 2018, I believe, which was patient safety is paramount. We wanted to start with that. But those other eight amongst our founders and partners, we, we did a really thoughtful, deep thinking experience around, let's look at who we are and what we want to emulate as a company. And we had a few different iterations. We worked with some coaches and came up with the eight and did some writing to it. And then some storytelling to those each eight as well that, that kind of defined who we were over that time period. And so since then, we've had these hold really strong and I think for now, like I haven't thought about adding anything or more, like I feel like they're, they're standing the test of time pretty good. But what I will say is the stories within them get better each time. And we do a really good job of looking for those throughout the year, not from me, but from the team members like you saw yesterday. That's where I think you can really get the culture to go alpha is when you can get the team sourcing and, and then working towards building those stories behind them. The stories that go along to reinforce the core values and principles are just so important. You've been heavily involved in giving back and participating in other organizations. Share a little bit about why that's important to you and maybe just a couple stories of some of the different foundations or organizations that you work with and, and why you find those particularly meaningful. I've always had an enjoyment and fulfillment from that in healthcare, both in dentistry, from Dental school, I helped build with a couple of classmates the entire Project Homeless Connect apparatus in San Francisco to where we were giving dental needs and ended up creating curriculum within the dental school to where it was a rotation for servicing those patients. So that was a lot of fun. I, I had a chance to sort of in the chaos of working in the community and partnering with the school and getting everybody to work together. That was fun. And also like we got great results from it at the same time. So coming out of dental school and working in some of the underserved areas we were in, I noticed that there was opportunity to really build around that too. So two really big places today that we work with. The first one is LEAP, the LEAP Foundation, which is the program we send students high school, typically sophomore, junior through first year of college, go for a week to, it was previously at UCLA, now it's at USC, 500 students from around the world come and they learn about entrepreneurship and all the things, soft skills that are not taught in books, but how to do that and practice it in life so that it can catapult them going into the real world. So that's a great program. I've seen it change lives for the last 15 years. And so we send every year, we've sent almost 200 students to that program from Rodeo over the last 10 years. And that's been awesome to see. And then 
some of these students, I will tell you, like the students we sent from Brownsville, Texas, some have never been on a plane before. And so now they're going to another state and meeting all these and they come back and they're like, they want to take on the world. And a couple of them have ended up going from like Brownsville. I think we had one that got into Harvard last year uh, in terms of like some of these schools that they're getting to. It's awesome to see. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So interested to see the questions they ask at that age. Like you, you're confident that the future is bright for our youth in the country. So that's one. I think the other one I'm really passionate about, Dennis Who Care. This is an organization that serves patients of need also in South Texas, along the border of Mexico and Texas. You have thousands of patients who have no access to care, no Medicare, anything at all that need dental work that a lot of times this inhibits them from being able to function in daily life, get a job. If you're in pain, you can't focus on these things. So they work with the local medical centers and we triage patients, not just within Rodeo, but with all practices in the Rio Grande Valley and Dennis to take care of these patients. On average, we do about a half million dollars of free dentistry a year down there. And most recently, we were able to convert it to a live continuing education course. So Dr. Mansoor, our partner, will do CE training on a lot of these days. We'll bring in speakers and we'll have live patient CE training. It's the only one in Texas, one of a handful across the country. So we're delivering free care. We're getting some really awesome dentists trained along the way. And it's just a win, win, win for everyone. And so I continue to serve on that board and we really want to build that into a, a program that grows. Both two really incredible causes. And I love the, the fact about with Leap, you know, with somebody that had never been on a plane before, gets that opportunity and their eyes are just opened to like what is out there and what is possible and the, their world broadens, their vision broadens and their kind of ambition can be lit up at that point. So. That's really neat. And I think, it, did we see some of that in the video yesterday as well? That was part of it. That was the describing Leap and talking about the week and what goes on there. That was very neat. So no, that's, that's incredible. Thank you for sharing both of those. So I'm curious, you know, you talked earlier about when you worked with Dr. Dorfman and worked in his office for a bit. And one of the statements you made that I thought was really interesting was you said, it helped me understand what was possible like within our industry. And as you're looking at dentistry today, and you know you have all these amazing accomplishments, there's a lot of different things that you're involved in, and you're kind of like putting on your forward-looking hat and looking to where dentistry is going. You know, there's a lot of talk about challenges. There's a lot of focus on same store growth. We know that there's struggles with inflation and costs of supplies and reimbursements. And there's always the challenges with insurance and payers and everything else that like has probably been around in one way, shape or form for quite some time, but maybe is even magnified more with what's happened over the past four years. But what still, when you think about dentistry and what it does for communities, what it does for the country, kind of but how it fulfills your mission, like what still really excites you about being involved in this industry? This is one of the greatest moments to be in our field. I'll tell you why. We are at the forefront. We're on the front doorstep of the first level of real investment and innovation that's coming in and rapidly. If we want to talk about what the DSO space and private equity has brought to our field, it's massive investment. There's more innovation happening and investment into the technology and now the AI piece than it's ever happened before. And it's global. Some of the stuff that's going on in Europe and Australia and South America, it's awesome to see. So I think we're going to see this huge influx of innovation. You know, they just did that first case on the patient with the robot. And so I think a lot of people like might go, oh my gosh, they're taking my job. No, this is going to relieve so much burden and cost that's really hindering the system. And I think open it up in ways that we're going to be able to better treat patients. We're going to do it at a faster pace, more efficient. Claim adjudication is going to get better with all the AI stuff. Diagnostic stuff is going to get better. Things aren't going to hurt as much or feel as scary because a lot of the things that used to cause that are going to be alleviated. So I think with all that said, that's going to allow better experiences. And then in the midst of all this, you have this awareness and awakening happening to how important oral health and dentistry is and how it connects to the whole body. So we went from being the 
providers that really weren't that important. <laughs> and, you know, like we're not even doctors, right? That's the only thing. You guys aren't even doctors, you're just dentists versus no, we're actually really integral to collection of data, working with the medical providers and integrating all that. Practices are now integrating medical and dental all over. So the next 20 years, I think is going to be incredible. And people that embrace that, we're going to have really cool dynamic models that we're going to see. And so I'm excited. I love when people copy some of our stuff and take that and and mold it. To me, that's a compliment. And so more of that, I think, to come. That is a fantastic explanation. And I agree with you. It, it really does feel like it's kind of the age of innovation for, for dentistry is upon us. And I just wanted to follow up with that real quick. When you talk about the procedure that was taken care of with the robot with the AI and you hear somebody that's like, oh, it's going to take our jobs. Like, I think you have a really healthy outlook on that. And I think there are those that are maybe fearful. It really does seem like those that just lean in to the future and are really kind of viewing it with eyes wide open to seek opportunities are going to be the ones that accelerate the most and are able to help the most people. How would you help your team understand those opportunities and how would you talk to them about it to where it doesn't seem so threatening and it is a complement to, not a replacement for? So here's where I think it's going to make providers better and more important in the future. Right now, we have all these lanes, specialty and even medical. We're not talking. Interoperability is still a challenge amongst practices and amongst the the different healthcare systems. What an AI robot that's doing the treatment can't do is it can't tell that patient that needs ortho and oral surgery and need to see their provider. And so the best providers in the future are going to be the ones that are really captaining that process and ensuring that everything is working together. And to me, that's going to lead to better outcomes. And so I think that's how we need to think about is what this is and what it can be. And that time that you might be spending doing one, which may now become less valuable at that moment, is now going to be really solving more complex problems that I think will bring more patients in because we can help them better. What would you tell yourself in 2008 if you could go back and have a conversation either a piece of advice or just some encouragement or anything at all? Is there anything that you can think of that you would have found particularly helpful? It's so funny you asked me. I just met someone who who I really much look up to, an incredible business person, really successful. And and I asked him that same question. (laughs) And it's funny. I mean, he goes, he looked at me, I I wouldn't change anything. I was like, that means you've done awesome. (laughs) I would tell myself, trust in your voice and speak in those moments when you're disrupting something, whether it's an industry or a group of folks, you know, because as we were going through this process in dentistry, there's still a lot of that stuff that if you look at when the DSO space started to grow from 15 years ago, that was met with a lot of fighting. And that wasn't just in tech, that was around the country. You had a lot of the dental organizations and the local chapters and, you know, you had ADA and D, you know, all of this was like battling. And what was a gift to me was growing up around it. I kind of understood the generation of the soul and I was able to talk to that, but there was a lot of friction. There was moments where I think I should have been more vocal and I probably could have been that that would be one area where if you're a young entrepreneur and you're disrupting and innovatively speak up and be proud of what you're doing and lean in. And I think that'll get you to places faster. Well said. Well, Dr. Zarabi, it looks like you guys are really doing things the right way. And I thank you so much for for joining on the show today. Where can people find you if they're interested in learning about any of the the foundations that you work with or Rodeo Dental in general or socials? You can find me on uh, Instagram at Dr. Sam Z or on LinkedIn just under my name. I'll respond and, uh, you know, if you want, you can post my email on the thing as well. And I'm, I'm happy to respond to those too. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. No, man. Thanks for all you're doing and, uh, and keep building. I love the podcast. It's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. The Dental Economist Show is brought to you by Planet DDS. To find out more about how cloud-based dental software by Planet DDS helps unleash dentists and their staff to focus on patient care, visit www.planetdds.com. Stay tuned for upcoming episodes by following wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening.